So while the issue of neurotoxicity of food dyes is in the news, it really isn't a new issue. Concerns of food dyes exacerbating symptoms of ADHD and autism have been expressed since the 1970s. We also know that autism has increased dramatically over the past 70 years to as many as 1 in 59 children in 2018. And the neurotoxic effects of food color are known since 2011. So we had some time to really figure this out. And we're talking here about, you know, blue 1, 2, green 3, yellow 5, 6, red 3, uh, 2, and 40, and so on. And artificial food colors, and it's important to make a distinction here, we're talking about artificial food colors, not natural food colors, right? Natural food colors are usually derived from, you know, the uh, skin of fruit and all that, and those are usually okay. But artificial food colors contain petroleum and are manufactured in the chemical process that includes formaldehyde, aniline, hydroxides, and sulfuric acid. Sounds beautiful, doesn't it? Also, impurities like lead, arsenic, and mercury may be present as well. Of course, you know, the industry will always argue, well, the amount of these chemicals in food dyes is very small and you would have to consume a lot for this to be toxic. But I think this is a terrible argument because we do not know on, on an individual basis how much a child consumes, in, you know, how much candy does a child eat, how much of these chemicals is in each type of candy. It's not labeled on the box and we just don't know. Also, there's different rates of absorption. Some children might absorb more of this than others. Some children might be better at excreting this uh, crap once it's in their system. Others might have a harder time with it, right? The point is that none of this is good, right? We do not need food colors. Food colors do not have any positive biologic effect in our bodies. The only purpose of food colors is there for the stuff to look pretty so people buy it. That's it, right? And, um, you know, again, that's not a very good reason for this. I talked about, you know, other uh, kind of uh, chemicals we use to make things look better, like titanium dioxide, and they use this in Skittles, right, to make the colors even pop out more, make them brighter. Same thing. No one needs this stuff. It's toxic. You know, we should not eat this at all, especially not for children. You know, we should be, you know, really thinking about that stuff. Anyway, um, so interestingly, to date, the FDA has not yet studied the effects of synthetic dyes on behavior in children. And of course, while that's not done, you know, the industry will always have a cop out and say, well, you know, we don't have any definitive studies yet on this, you know, so we're waiting for that. And while that's going on, we can still put it in our food, which I think is a terrible thing. And I'm not saying that the FDA should just outlaw or forbid the use of all this stuff, but at least put a label on it, right? Put the label on the cereal saying, hey, listen, this cereal has red number 40 and uh, blue number two and whatever else is in there. So, you know, this has been shown to be neurotoxic and might negatively influence the development of your child and might increase your child's risk to develop autism and other uh, neurologic diseases. But so if you want to go ahead, buy it, go ahead. I guarantee you most parents that read that label would be like, mm, probably not a good idea. I'm not going to buy that stuff. But again, as long as we are not aware of it, as long as it's not labeled, people are going to keep giving this to their kids, unfortunately, right? And until recently, I've given this to my children. I've bought a bunch of candy that had this stuff. Chewing gum has this stuff. It's in many, many things, right? Now, a uh, 2020 meta-analysis on uh, food color and autism states that while, you know, the research does not prove that food coloring actually causes autism, spectrum disorder, there seems to be a link. So again, the industry will say, well, this is not definitive. They did a meta-analysis. There's no proof for it. There's a link. So they think there's an association, you know, but we cannot give, give causality here. The point is, we are never going to have a study where we're going to have a group of children that we're going to feed food colors to and a food that we do not feed food colors, observe them for many years and then see what are the rates of autism in each group. That's never going to happen. And we know that, right? Many of these data, the, these data have been observed in animal studies and many of these data are uh, observed also in behavioral studies that we have, right? And I think that should be sufficient. We know this stuff is toxic. There's no question about it. You can ask anybody, you know, how much formaldehyde would you like to give your child? What's the RDA for that? What's, you know, the, the RDA for uh, the petroleum? What's the RDA for arsenic, right? It should be zero. That's the whole point of it, right? And we're never going to have a study that's done longitudinally where, you, where we're observing these groups. It would be eth ethically never possible to do so. And this is the same reason that the cigarette industry gave for many years, you know, until the 1980s. They're saying, well, yes, we're kind of aware that there is a correlation between people smoking cigarettes and lung cancer, but we have not seen definitive data. And until that's the case, we're going to keep selling that stuff, you know. Again, they still sell that stuff today, which I think is fine because now it's clear, it's labeled, it says on the box of cigarettes, hey, you smoke this, you might get lung cancer, right? That's fair. And then you can make decisions. For children, though, I would like there to be a bit of a stricter, you know, uh, guide than that because I think, you know, we need to at least have the label or consider putting a label on, hey, don't use this under 18 years of age. But, but we need to be aware of this. 
So I think it's a cop-out to just say, oh, we don't have a definitive study on this yet, so we're not going to take this off the market. We should be aware of this. Don't buy anything, as I always say, that hasn't been around 150 years ago. It should be good, because this stuff definitely hasn't been around for that long, right? OK, I have two questions that, uh, questions that were asked the whole time. Uh, one is on uh, vegetable oils, sorry, on seed oils. And the question was, what about vegetable oils? Now, vegetable oils, unfortunately, are seed oils. The term vegetable oil sounds beautifully. There are no vegetables in vegetable oils. They're made from seeds. They're made from soybean, canola, and so on. These are the seed oils that you should avoid, in my opinion. Very high in omega-6 and linoleic acid. So the term vegetable oil is a marketing gimmick to make it sound beautiful. Because you know, we've all heard that vegetables are good for you. Vegetable oil must be excellent, and it's good. And the American Heart Association still says, well, look, that stuff does lower your LDL cholesterol, which is true. It also causes oxidization of the LDL cholesterol, which then causes atherosclerosis, you know, and many papers show that. So vegetable oils, don't buy that stuff. It's all crap. The only oils, again, that I recommend for cooking is avocado oil. Make sure it's 100% pure avocado oil. You can use olive oil at low heat. Um, you can use certainly things like... Um, Coconut oil, but that has its own flavor kind of to it. Beef tallow is fine. Butter is fine. I mean, these are all things that you can cook with at lower temperatures. Beef tallow you can use at high temperatures, and avocado oil is my go-to when I do anything at high temperatures usually, right? The second question was about the LED near-infrared bed. So they look like these tanning beds, and uh, we have them at our clinics. People sell these, these panels of them. And um, LED NIR, the frequencies here, we're talking about the lights you see, the red light is around 630 to 650 nanometers. The reason we see it, it's still in the visible spectrum. And NIR, the near infrared, you don't actually see. It's outside the visible spectrum, usually around 850 nanometers. So what these do, they go to different depths of levels in skin and tissue and, in, uh, and kind of induce the production of melatonin in the mitochondria of your cells. And that sounds really complicated. But essentially, melatonin here is not the same that we think of for sleep. That's melatonin as well. At night when we sleep, the pineal gland in your brain secretes melatonin to help you sleep, to regulate your sleep rhythm, right? Here, we're talking about melatonin in the mitochondria of the cells, which is hugely important for the health of the cell. This kind of determines if your cell is and stays healthy, if the cell can uh, do its function properly. And that's hugely important. What triggers this? I mean, again, this near infrared light is a, a large part of natural sunlight. So if we get natural sunlight, you're going to get a lot of near infrared light. You don't have to be baking in the sun. Then, of course, you increase your risk of skin cancer because there's also UV light, which is on the opposite of, of the spectrum. That's a high energy short wavelength. Here, the um, LED and NIR are longer wavelengths, right? But anyway, so um, there are studies that have shown this near infrared light can uh, treat or decrease the severity of um, neuro neurologic disorders like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So they really can take these neurons that are deteriorating and revive them. And it's a hugely important thing. But um, you know, having exposure to either natural sunlight regularly, and you can be in the shade, it, can, it reflects from green surfaces. So if you're uh, walking in nature and there's trees around, you don't have to be baking in the sun. It'll reflect, right? It'll also go through thin clothing. So like cotton shirt will definitely go through that, right? But regular exposure to sunlight is hugely important. Or if that's not a possibility, then one of those beds that we're using, I think, is fantastic. I use it about three times a week. I think it makes a huge difference. Also for recovery, when I'm working out, I recover a lot faster with this. But that was kind of the air question. So yeah, these are uh, LED in the infrared light. These are the wavelengths, 630, 850 nanometers. And again, it produces more melatonin in the mitochondria of your cells. And we know that mitochondrial health is hugely important for your overall health of your body, right? We think that a lot of issues <clears throat> that we're facing today are metabolic in nature, right? And this might even be true for things like cancer, um, heart disease, and autoimmune disorders, that these are more um, of a uh, metabolic issue starting in the mitochondria and then later on manifest in things like, for example, disruption of DNA in the nucleus. So this is a long answer to this question. I think this is hugely important that we have enough of this near infrared light regularly, and these beds just make it a lot easier.